This is the New England Journal of Medicine COVID-19 update for February 17th, 2021. I'm Stephen Morrissey, Managing Editor of the Journal, and I'm joined by Eric Rubin, Editor-in-Chief, and Lindsay Baden, Deputy Editor. Today, we're also joined by Sir Jeremy Farrer. Jeremy is an infectious disease researcher who worked in Vietnam for many years, where he led the Oxford University Clinical Research Unit in Ho Chi Minh City, where he studied a number of infections, including tuberculosis, typhoid fever, and influenza. In 2013, he took the helm at the Wellcome Trust, which is one of the major funders of research and science education in the United Kingdom and around the world. In particular, Wellcome plays an important role in global health, and Jeremy and his colleagues have helped to set both the research and the treatment agendas. This has been true through several epidemics, including Ebola outbreaks and, of course, the current COVID-19 pandemic. In addition, Jeremy's been an important advisor to many organizations, including the World Health Organization and to us as a member of our editorial board. So recently, it's become clear that the viral sequence is varying over the course of the COVID-19 epidemic in ways that are functionally significant. But before we discuss that, let's go back to the early days of the outbreak. Was variation occurring then? Steve, it's true. Variants were described almost from the beginning of the epidemic. Viral replication is imperfect, and there are often changes introduced into the genome. This happens at a very high rate for some viruses, like retroviruses, such as HIV. But it's certainly true that in any epidemic viral illness, variants emerge. Many people have tried to use influenza as a model for respiratory viral infection where variants emerge. But it's both a good and bad example, because It's certainly true that variants arise through genetic changes, through mutation, with an accumulation of variants that probably have little bearing on the infection process itself. So this process called genetic drift is probably akin to what's happening with SARS-CoV-2. Influenza has a segmented genome though, and the various genomic segments can become reassorted, resulting in vast changes to the virus in a single step. This rare event, which is called genetic shift, results in a dramatically changed virus, which can cause enormous outbreaks and more severe disease. But that doesn't happen in SARS-CoV-2, where there's only a single genome. So the smaller changes that were seen initially with SARS-CoV-2 were probably just the result of replication errors that accumulated over time, but weren't so important to the evolution of the virus. They did provide us with molecular markers that allowed us to identify individual strains, And that allowed us to trace the epidemiology of infection. But as far as we know, the early changes were not associated with any particular changes in the behavior of the viruses. So Eric, I think that the issue of viral replication, viral adaptation, we're witnessing evolution. And we have to remember that SARS-CoV-2 jumped species a little more than a year ago. So it's a brand new virus for uh, humans. That has created several challenges. One, there are seven and a half billion of us who are potentially susceptible and therefore can be amplifying of the virus. And we've witnessed that going on across the globe, across the country, across Europe. That sheer number of viral replication with millions and millions of individuals infected leads to a very large number of viromes that are being generated, some of which are generated with replication perfection. Many of them are generated with errors in replication, some of which may give adaptation advantages. And that's what we're witnessing in all sorts of different places around the world. And those mutations that lead to some kind of advantage will allow those strains to succeed more as this virus evolves in a new species, being us. And so we're witnessing that evolution, which is not a surprise, but the speed of which is in part related to the sheer number of people infected and the sheer amount of virus being created daily, and some of which then will turn out to have advantages as we co-evolve which is all the virus is trying to do is survive. And it's doing that in a way that allows it to survive better in a new species. So as a clinician rather than a virologist, so please excuse 
any errors here. But the way I portray this is really, as Lindsay described there, we're witnessing, which we don't witness very often, the emergence of a new virus that's come across the species barrier to humans, where humanity has no immunity. It is, in my view, in the first nine months or so of 2020, it is evolving biologically to improve how it binds to the receptor the amount of virus in the nose and throat that may increase transmission to other people. And so it's going through a period of biological evolution, I think, in the first nine months of last year. In the latter part of last year, we added an additional evolutionary pressure, which was increasing natural immunity. So now the virus is biologically adapting to humanity, and it's now under an immune pressure as well through natural immunity and starting to be under an immune pressure in by vaccines. And I imagine that it is no coincidence that three major variants have appeared in the last quarter of last year. And I think we have to assume going into 2021 that we will see, if anything, a speeding up of that evolution as the virus now contends with both its adaptation to humans and the humanity's immune response. And I think it's a really important report, which I've only read about in a report so far, but what seems to be the first evidence of a recombination event in California earlier this month, which brought together the B117 variant and the B1429 variant that originated in California. If that's true, that's a really important finding because it gets to Eric's point about the combination of drift and potential for more radical changes through shift. So just to be clear, and I think that's a really good point, Just to be clear, the recombination of a virus which has its entire genome on a single molecule results from two viruses infecting the same cell and a crossover event occurring to move a large number of variant nucleotides over rather than the reassortment that happens in flu. But nevertheless, it can result in rather large changes. And it also, I think, also means that we need to consider this as a human infection. And in my belief, it's now a human endemic infection. But we also must try and ensure that we don't create large animal reservoirs of this virus as well, because that will allow parallel evolution to occur in multiple different species. And that's ultimately what we see in influenza, where, of course, there's a very large animal reservoir in addition to the very large human reservoir. Jeremy, how do we prevent establishing itself in an animal reservoir? We're interacting with animals all the time. We are. We just need to make sure that when we're conducting surveillance, we don't forget the animal reservoir. The mink studies in Denmark and other parts, certainly of Europe, and I believe North America, remain very, very important studies. And, of course, actually working out where the origins of this virus came from, not to pass blame, but to learn for the future. So not much on this topic of viral mutations has been published in the peer-reviewed literature, but I know, Jeremy, that you've been looking into how changes in the virus might be affecting transmission. What have you found? Well, I think increasingly this is coming into the published literature, and I think we have to, you know, firstly praise the journals, which always goes down well when you're on a New England Journal podcast, but the journals have played a really important role in making sure that data gets into the public domain in a reviewed way as quickly as possible and deserve great credit. Uh, I think it's very clear to me from the evidence from the UK, which is obviously the information I have most available to me, that the variant that arose in the UK first described ancestrally in about September of last year, but it became prominent in November and December at a time when the UK was in a period of quite draconian lockdown. And important to recognize the first evidence of a change was a change in epidemiology. There was an increased transmission going on at a time when we would not have normally expected that with very heavy restrictions in place. And subsequently, that epidemiological information was tied to genomic information. And it was clear that there was a new variant which was responsible for that increasing transmission in the UK. And there have been figures described that it increases transmission increases by maybe 0.6, 0.5, 0.6, 0.7, that sort of level of increased transmission. So a really significant increase. And also concerningly, it's come to dominate the UK. It's gone from one or two percentages in October, November to now being the dominant strain in the UK and indeed in much of Europe now. 
but it's also led to an increase uh, from very preliminary data in the case fatality rate of individuals infected with that new variant, perhaps increasing case fatality by as much as 25 or 30 percent. Jeremy, I'm curious about the increased case fatality rate that you were just discussing. Is that a more virulent virus or is it selecting a group of patients that are more susceptible or more likely to have severe disease? Yeah, it's a great question. And of course, there's great uncertainty about all of this. We are learning in real time, day to day, things are changing and information is changing. But in the so-called second wave in the UK, so the second last quarter of last year, there does seem to have been a shift to a slightly younger more female population in hospital during that second wave in the UK. But I have not seen any data that suggests the second wave and the new variant has been affecting people with higher degrees of comorbidity or difference age-wise compared to the original variant that took off in the UK in March of 2020. So I think this is, at the moment, I think the working hypothesis for this is that that variant drives a higher severity and a higher case fatality rate as well as a higher transmission. And of course, that's a big concern. A more transmissible virus that was less virulent would be one thing to contend with. A more transmissible virus, which also comes with increased case fatality, is a major concern. And just to finish that off um, with some work that, you know, a lot of it going on in the United States, but also at uh, Diamond uh, Synchrotron here in the UK, And that is when you look at the SARS-CoV-2 virus, it would seem from structural biology mapping studies that the virus has still got quite a long way to evolve, potentially. The affinity between the virus and its human receptor, the ACE2 receptor, is not optimized as well as it potentially could be yet. You could increase the affinity at that binding site more than the mutations have currently given it. So I think we need to see the variants as being hugely important, of really great concern, and the public health response has got to be to try and reduce the transmission, reduce the amount of virus circulating in the world, and offer vaccines to as many people as we can in all parts of the world to try and drive down transmission and reduce the amount of virus, because ultimately evolution is a factor of the prevalence of the virus globally. And Jeremy, you talk about the UK 117 variant. There's also, you know, the other major variants being discussed, the 351, which was observed in South Africa and the P1 in Brazil. How do you see the evolution of those viruses in comparison to the 117? Well, I think, frankly, they're all very concerning. And early on, and still, I think the prevailing evidence to date suggests that the UK variant continues to be susceptible to all of the monoclonal antibody therapies that have been so far made available for treatment, and that all of the vaccines currently being used remain highly efficacious against that variant. The more worrying variants, the 351 and the P1 first described in Brazil, they both seem to reduce the efficacy of treatments, monoclonal antibodies, but also they certainly reduce the mutualization that we see in the serum from people who have been vaccinated. And whilst we don't have epidemiologically and clinical data yet to confirm the reduction in vaccine efficacy against those variants at sufficient scale, nevertheless, it's a very important warning that if we allow the virus to evolve further, we may well get into trouble with the first generation vaccines and their vaccine efficacy. It's not true today, I think, but it is a warning that it could well be true in the future. So looking at that issue of the effect on the current vaccines of these variants, today we published two research letters that perhaps help us understand this. What did we learn? Well, to summarize, I think we learned precisely what Jeremy was saying. Um, Just to go into a little more detail on those studies, there were two different groups that looked at antisera taken from patients who'd received vaccines and measured their ability to neutralize the virus in vitro. One group looked at antibodies from people immunized with mRNA-1273, the Moderna vaccine, early on during the phase one trial, and tested that on the variant viruses. To summarize very briefly, the antibodies could neutralize the UK strain, the B117 strain, at levels that were roughly similar to the wild type virus, but had a decreased ability to neutralize the South African variant, B1351. 
The other study looked at serum from patients from the Pfizer vaccine study, the BNT162B2 study, and they found, again, similar neutralization of the UK variant and somewhat decreased activity against the South African variant. But I think it's important to keep in mind what Jeremy said, which is these are in vitro studies. We don't know if there's a threshold for neutralization that defines protection. In fact, we don't even know that there's a quantitative correlation between antibody levels and protection right now. So it's very concerning, I think, but we don't know for sure the clinical significance of these findings. Eric, I think it's important to stress that the in vitro data, looking at decreased susceptibility to neutralizing antibodies, are important data, but don't actually inform us directly as to protection or clinical activity. And we have to be careful about what we think the correlate of protection is. And it may be multifactorial. It may be more than one type of antibody. There may be cellular responses. And so we will have to do the iterative scientific process of the human studies, the laboratory work back to the human studies to better define what protection means and then how to optimize vaccine constructs. But that being said, we know that there are individuals, and we don't have real numbers, who have been infected with previous variants who are now infected with new variants, suggesting that at least their immune response to a natural infection hasn't protected them particularly well against a second infection. And some of those patients have developed severe disease. So it is concerning. I think it's also really critical to emphasize that the progress in the last year has been nothing short of staggering, but there remain a huge number of unanswered questions. When we talk about, we don't yet have the correlates of protection, Lindsay, as you rightly said, we don't understand the balance between neutralizing antibodies and cellular responses. We don't understand the duration of protection from vaccines. We don't understand with the vaccines, whether they protect against severe disease, mild disease. We've got good evidence. They do provide that protection but we don't have very much information yet on whether they are effective against transmission and indeed against new strains clinically and epidemiologically. It's why that the vaccine progress has been absolutely staggering. There's a lot more research that has to get done over the course of the next year or two if we're going to answer these questions, and they will be absolutely critical questions for the long term. And just one more consideration, which is implied. We have to be careful about a universal correlate of protection versus different vaccine platforms may elicit different kinds of immune responses that confer protection through different mechanisms. And so, as you say, Jeremy, we have a lot more research to do to ferret out these different pathways to best use them to our advantage. Yes. And also very important to say as well, we are using vaccines now across the whole world, a very diverse populations across all ages. That's quite an unusual vaccine rollout. We normally think of vaccinating young individuals or senior individuals. We're vaccinating all ages, all backgrounds, all communities, variable nutrition status, variable health status. And we're bound to see a difference in responses across all of that sort of population diversity. So looking at the question of vaccination around the world raises the question of availability. We know that countries like the United States and the United Kingdom have contracts with manufacturers for more doses than are actually necessary to vaccinate all their citizens. But at the same time, most countries are having difficulty in securing supplies for themselves. Jeremy, I know that there are consortia that are acting as clearinghouses for vaccine procurement. How is this working and how likely is it to succeed? I think it has to succeed. <laughs> Um, it's not a question of if it should succeed. I think it has to succeed. And this clearinghouse you're talking about, there is one, I think, really, and that is through the ACT Accelerator, the Acceleration of Tools Against COVID-19 that is convened by the WHO, but has partnerships with many, many countries. I think 150 or 160 countries are now signatories, delighted to say, since the end of January, that the United States has joined the ACT Accelerator and the COVAX facility and has been very welcomed into that. Of course, United States scientists have played a critical role over the last year as well, but it's fantastic to have now the political support of the United States within the ACT Accelerator. And the ACT Accelerator is there to push forward the tools that are needed from the health systems, oxygen, PPE, but also diagnostics, treatment and vaccines. 
And with the backing of groups of governments, G7, G20, but also the World Bank, regional development banks, and others to make sure that countries can work through the ACT Accelerator to get access essentially to all of the vaccines that are in the broad global portfolio, vaccines produced in the United States, in Europe, in China, and I hope in the future potentially from Russia as well if those vaccines pass through pre-qualification within the World Health Organization. So it is a clearinghouse, it ensures, I think, access, it also ensures price, which is obviously very important. And I would call out here industry, which I think has stepped up to the table in 2020 to produce these vaccines and has worked, I think, very constructively with the ACT Accelerator to make sure these vaccines are available, not just in the rich world, but globally. And I would hope that in February of 2021, we will start to see the rollout of vaccines into countries which may not themselves be able to afford those vaccines. Jeremy, I think an important point that we've always emphasized in infectious diseases is that they don't respect borders. And so along with the question of equity and fairness, that countries should all have access to these, we were just talking about how variants arise through selection in these populations that have developed disease and have some immune response and therefore the ability to generate variants which avoid that immune response. It's in everyone's interest that vaccines be rolled out very broadly, because otherwise I think we are jeopardizing the vaccines that we're making now, the ones you call the first generation vaccines. If the variant doesn't arise in the US or the UK, but it arises in Ghana or Mali, it's still going to spread around the world, So, uh, given what we know. So I think it's extremely important that we all are invested in the success of this operation. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Eric. I mean, this is one of those occasions where however you see the world, whether you see it through a global health agenda, whether you see it through a equity, a moral and ethical agenda, whether you see it through a purely financial agenda, an economic one or a political one, this is one of those cases where all of those align. It is in everybody's enlightened self-interest to reduce the amount of virus circulating and to do that on a global scale. And if we don't do that, the truth is that new variants will occur somewhere. They may occur first in the United States. They may occur first in uh, South Asia or Europe or the continent of Africa and Central South Africa. They could occur anywhere. But you can be absolutely sure that if they do occur somewhere, if they have a sufficient biological advantage, they will spread around the world very, very quickly. And if we allow that to happen and those variants escape vaccines and treatments, then I'm afraid we will have pandemics within pandemics which will reverberate for many years to come. Just getting back a little bit to the issue of availability of current tools that we've created, uh, such as vaccines. I think one of the key observations I think has emerged, not only the issue that we are all in this together globally, and we need to realize that, but is our capacity to manufacture and distribute tools that get developed. And I think on the vaccine front, manufacturing capacity, which Jeremy, as you say, industry has really stepped up to the plate to help make things possible, is still woefully inadequate for the global need. And I don't think that's something that the community fully appreciates how complicated it is to manufacture properly, but also how much of a pressure point that is in the global response process. Yeah, absolutely. And we're going to have to revisit this. I mean, it was only quite recently, as recently as I think 2009, before the influenza pandemic of 2009, that even the United States did not have adequate domestic manufacturing capacity. Now, I think to a large degree, you put that right after the pandemic, but most countries outsource their manufacturing. Whilst that may be reasonable, we don't need manufacturing in every single country, we are going to have to rethink the distribution of manufacturing capacity certainly to a regional level in the future, if not to an absolute national level. I think there are going to be advances technologically though in manufacturing as well, which will allow scale up to happen quicker from some of these platform technologies where the advances have been made in the last 12 months. And I actually think the future of vaccinology generally, manufacturing and science has uh, stepped forward so rapidly in 2020 that we will reap the benefits of that in this tragedy for many, many years to come. I'm particularly interested in in the future of vaccine manufacturing for things like epidemics, in actually engaging with countries, for instance, with small populations themselves, where manufacturing could both supply their domestic needs very quickly, 
but they could also be suppliers of the rest of the world where they have small populations. I'm thinking of countries like Denmark, Singapore, Senegal, countries with relatively small populations who could provide their domestic needs quite easily and could also be an export of vaccines around the world. Which requires a global framework to enable such interactions to occur. And we've been struggling with that with influenza for decades. And hopefully the current events will help catalyze us as a global community. Absolutely. You know, I think for many of us, the epidemics, of course, many people go back to Ebola in 2014, 2016 as a pivotal moment. Actually, I think we've got to look back further than that. We've got to look back, in my view, at least to the outbreak of the Nipah virus in Malaysia in 1999 and and just think of those warnings through those 20 years of Nipah and MERS and SARS-1 and, of course, the pandemic of 2009, COVID now, uh, Zika, Ebola, of course. We're in an era now of more frequent and more complex epidemics, and we need to put in place the infrastructure, the global agreements that would allow us to both prevent those and then respond to them better, frankly, than we have done in 2020. Jeremy, you and Welcome have been advocating for better preparedness for epidemics, at least since the Ebola outbreaks. In fact, you were extensively quoted on the subject in an article on The Guardian in December 2019, before COVID-19 was apparent. Looking back from the perspective of today, we clearly need to take this more seriously. What have we learned so far about how to do that? Yes, you know, it's always difficult to frame risks and threats and vulnerabilities. Um, It's very easy to be both personally concerned and be accused of being the, if the boy that cried wolf is a story that translates into American literature, I'm I'm not sure. But yes, we've had a series of warnings over the last 20 years. And I think those warnings have not been taken as seriously as they should have been, of course. Uh, And COVID has been the end result of that. But we should also remember that the pandemic is the end result of a series of drivers which are going to remain with us, in my view, through the 21st century. They are changing ecology, changing land use, changing interactions between humans and animals, humans living in huge cities, which are very densely populated and highly connected, both within the country and globally. And those are all of the drivers you need for animal infections, which uh, most emerging infections are, have the opportunity to come across into humans and cross that species barrier and then gain a foothold in the human population and then spread globally, exactly what we've seen in COVID-19. And I think we need to be aware that those drivers are not going to get less. If anything, they're going to increase in the coming years. And therefore, we're likely to see more frequent and more complex epidemics and pandemics and we need to have the infrastructure to prevent and respond to them. And the second point I'd make uh, is that I think COVID-19, 2020, 2021, has really demonstrated the critical importance of research in an epidemic. It was controversial during Ebola that you could push forward clinical trials of therapies and social science studies to investigate behavior and how you influence that how you communicate actual studies of that, and also critically trials of vaccines in the context of an epidemic. And I I think Ebola changed people's attitude to the importance of research in epidemic settings. I think we've learned a huge amount during 2020 and 21 of why that is just so pivotal. Things like the active trials in the United States for for therapies, the uh, trials of vaccines across the world, and of course the trials in the UK of therapies in the recovery trial and in the WHO solidarity trial. These have been absolutely pivotal to improving care, saving lives and preventing through vaccination. And just a reminder that in the influenza pandemic of 2009, as my memory serves me, not a single patient was randomised to a treatment trial in the United States or UK in that pandemic. That's been very different this time around. So I think we have to celebrate some progress. I agree absolutely, Jeremy, although I will point out, and and I think it's another lesson for the future, is the rapidity with which we do that, because patients weren't randomized into trials for a very long time, given the magnitude of this outbreak. Certainly in the U.S., uh, we were treating patients without any of that information. Rather than putting them into clinical trials, uh, we were making guesses early on. And I think next time around, hopefully we are willing to engage in research right from the start. 
I think the only way to engage a research from the start is that that research is going on before the start. If you try and cobble together networks, collaborations, partnerships, clinical trials, contracts to allow money to flow, if you try and establish those in a crisis, you'll fail and you won't get the answers you critically need. My view is what you do before a crisis determines how a crisis will unfold in your community. And in my view, for clinical research, that means having not just protocols on shelves. In fact, that's not good enough. It means having clinical trial infrastructure that is doing important clinical trials day in, day out, that are important public health and clinical questions for people all of the time, and then has the ability to pivot when something unusual happens. Protocols on shelves are just not good enough. We need better clinical trial infrastructure, which can pivot when it's necessary. So, Jeremy, the interpandemic period is a time we don't spend enough time thinking about. We respond to the crisis. We don't plan. And the question I was going to ask, which you partially answered, what have we done well? Many things that you have illuminated. But what do we need to do better? And clinical trials infrastructure is one thing that you just mentioned. But what other things should we as a community be paying attention to in the next few years, hopefully, there'll be years before the next pandemic, that we're better prepared to respond more quickly? That's a huge question and would be worth a podcast on its own. Um, I think, firstly, it's a real appreciation and an understanding that these epidemics, whether national, regional or global, I'm afraid are inevitable. It's not a case of if, it truly is a case of when, and we will see them more frequently. We need to put aside geopolitics and nationalism. We need to have global partnerships because pathogens, viruses do not respect borders. And that starts with having health systems that are functional and have surge capacity, not functioning at 105% all the time, but have spare capacity. It means a trusted global surveillance system, again, not just for epidemics, but providing utility all of the time looking at drug-resistant infections, looking at uh, infections in people who may be immunocompromised or uh, having surgery or in, in critical care units around the world. It means having surveillance systems that are providing utility all of the time, not just focused on epidemics. The data needs to be shared, but it needs to be shared in a way that's equitable. And that if you share the data, you share the benefits of sharing that data. Uh, you have access to the information that flows from it and you have access to interventions in the future when they're developed, including treatments and vaccines. That has to be a flow of benefits as well as sharing of data. And then finally, I think we need to have clinical research and vaccine research that's going on all of the time and is providing public health and clinical value, and then has the capacity to respond when something changes, and then have all of that infrastructure and administration in place and the ability to respond, not in three or six months, but in three or six hours, effectively, certainly three or six days, is the sort of time frame we need to be thinking of, not weeks or months. I hope we as a community, realizing what SARS-CoV-2 is teaching us, we have a multi-trillion dollar global catastrophe that we are still in the middle of. How to strategically invest going forward you know, as you've outlined, and as I'm sure many others have strong feelings about, is something we collectively have to seriously think about, or we will continue to repeat these episodes as we've witnessed over the last 20 years. Yeah, if this pandemic doesn't change things, then I don't think anything will. And, and actually, I'm optimistic on this. I think the penny, the cent, the euro, the yen will have dropped, the RMB as well, on this. And I would hope that uh, inevitably some of Frankly, the geopolitical tensions of the early part of 2020 may, I hope, have disappeared to a degree now. And as we learned in the 20th century, you need to come out of these crises and address the real root causes of them rather than just covering them up and thinking you can go back to business as usual, because you can't. You have to reform after a crisis, otherwise you're doomed to repeat it. And uh, we learned that a few times in the 20th century. It'd be wise not to repeat it in the 21st. Thank you, Jeremy. And thank you, Eric and Lindsay.